to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today, we're going to be talking about security on the African continent, and my guest is an expert on this topic. Dr. Hussein Solomon is a senior professor in the Center for Gender and Africa Studies at the University of the Free State in Bloemfontein, South Africa. He is also the co-author of a new book titled African Security in the Anthropocene. Dr. Hussein Solomon, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Well, thanks for having me. It's an absolute pleasure being here. I appreciate you being with me today. Let's dive right into this security. Everybody is interested in security. We need it worldwide. Uh, explain your title a little bit. What types of security are you talking about? And what is the Anthropocene? Sure. When you think of security, I mean, you, I mean, today, for example, is the anniversary of 9-11 and, and, and people think of terrorism, people think of war and stuff like that. But when you're talking about security, especially in the African context, we are talking about a concept that the, that the UNDP, the, the United Nations Development Program spoke about, which is about human security and it's about us. And in terms of the Anthropocene, uh, this was a phrase uh, coined by natural scientists explaining the age that we live in where human activities is essentially warming up the planet, heating up the planet, um, and where climate change is real. So the activities of humanity is actually undermining our security. So specifically in terms of the book, I'm focusing in on the issue of of the impact of climate change on conflict in Africa, if I can put it that way. Yes. Now, there have been several areas of conflict in Africa and many other parts of the world, too, and much of it accelerated by climate change. The one that comes to mind is with Ethiopia and Egypt. What, what exactly was that particular issue? Well, uh, if you take the waters of, of the Nile, which uh, which originates in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia essentially built a dam, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam there, which meant less water downstream for Sudan and Egypt. And both of these countries threatened war uh, because of that, because it's not just simply about food insecurity, and uh, but it was also about Egypt generating hydroelectric power, the Aswan Dam, where the River Nile comes in. And so here you see a very real example of where um, water is essentially causing conflict, possible war between countries. Have they resolved the issue? I'm sure it's not totally resolved, but are they, are they working to come to some peaceful conclusion? Look, they have tried. Uh, uh, there is numerous um, talks and dialogues and so on. I think one of the most important initiatives is the Nile Basin Initiative, which is essentially where the 11 riparian states on the Nile form a commission where they have a rotating head. Uh, the headquarters is in Entebbe in Uganda, and essentially where they try to work out an equitable arrangement around the waters of the Nile. And it is so critical. Uh, of course, Africa is a, the countries of Africa are major players, especially at the United Nations to a large degree. But also, I think, as I recall, the African continent has 1.4 billion people out of the 8 billion on the planet. It's the second largest continent. It is wealthy in so many of the natural resources that are going to be used in the future for clean energy, for batteries, and for different things like that. So the African continent is a critical player. And as we've seen in the past, climate change has been caused primarily, as, as the scientists say, by the use of fossil fuels. And of course, we see that the economically developed countries are the ones who created most of the climate change problems. But so many of the de economically developing countries, like in Asia, Africa, Latin America, they are feeling the brunt of it, are they not? In other areas, with uh, the way their agricultural practices are changing, the way desertification is taking place, droughts setting in, and that type of thing. Mm. Well, Africa is one of the most uh, affected countries by climate change. And part of the problem uh, why that is so is because 
uh, it's still very much largely a rural continent, okay? Mm. And uh, now one of the big problems you have and, and why it is felt because we lack the necessary technical and scientific capacity, but also the financial resources. The other uh, problem is when I say we, I'm, I'm also referring to the way farming is set up on the African continent. So 80% of farming is done by subsistence agriculture. So it's not commercial intensive farming like in the US. So they lack the capital necessary to actually engage in the in the uh, ability to move to more green farming and and more uh, highly co uh, commercial intensive farming and and so on. But having said that, I mean there was an Africa Climate Summit uh, now, and uh, President William Ruto of Kenya has essentially taken the lead about the greening of Africa, making use of technology and so forth. Uh, and there's various things that he has proposed, because what we know is that because of globalization and so forth, the problems of Africa is not Africa's own. So he has proposed uh, at this Africa Climate Summit various things, including um, the removal of fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and then, of course, looking at capital coming from the global north to assist African farmers to move. But in my view, one of the big challenges is, again, the 80% of subsistence farmers who was, who are just farming at a, a small level and can't adapt. So something has to give at that level. It certainly does. It certainly does. And you mentioned a very critical point, too, because every, I won't say every country, but a large number of countries are subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. If they had to compete with clean energy, if they had to compete with uh, sun or solar productions or with wind or something like that, they would be not nearly as able to compete, I would imagine. And so it's really promising to hear this. You mentioned the African summit. That was a very major summit. In fact, I think that was the mm. first one ever sponsored by the, mm. uh, co-sponsored by the African Union and Kenya hosted it. So it looks as though there are some very substantive recommendations that came out of it that will be built upon in the future. Do you see future summits like that taking place? Well, it was the first. Um, I yes. think what I liked, what I liked about it, was I mean we're so used to uh, having this us versus them mentality, right? So it's the global north versus the global south, and I think that what I specifically was drawn to was the fact that um, President Ruto made it very, very clear that climate change is not a global North or a global South problem. It's everybody's problems. And therefore we need to collectively uh, work together that we as humanity will either sink or swim on this issue. So I saw it while it was the African Climate Summit. I mean, as you know, there were many Northern countries who had attended as well. And the kind of things that he's been talking about, is, uh, like the removal of fossil fuel subsidies, but also I think when he was talking about the targeted taxes on specific uh, sectors like aviation and maritime and so forth, because when you're talking about this this green transition, uh, the, the question of funding is going to come up. And so it has to be funded. There are, have been many great ideas, but the capacity there and in terms of Africa, Africa simply does not have the financial resources. Many African countries are heavily in debt. And, uh, and uh, you know, we need to work together with the global north for, for us to meet certain targets, but to have a cash infusion from the global north and for partnerships between between the global north and the global south. And I specifically want to emphasize here the importance of the private sector unleashing them in terms of, of doing this, because one of the problems in terms of the African state is its inability, its incapacities. So unleash the power of global capital to assist us with that transition. That's very important. The private sector has a critical role to play in dealing with this particular problem. You were talking about other or a recent conference, the group of 20 just met not long ago, and they invited the African Union 
to be a member of the group of 20, which makes it now the group of 21. And of course, that idea was pushed by President Joe Biden and also Prime Minister Modi of India. How do you think that will help to maybe unleash more of that private funding that you were talking about or technical resources to help countries that do not have large treasuries or, or need some uh, infrastructure assistance in dealing with this problem? Well, first of all, I don't want to throw cold water on the idea. I think it's a good idea for African representation and for the world to come together as one. Having said that, one of the big problems in terms of the African Union is yeah. the fact that there's no unity inside the African Union, right? So you have one country going in this direction and one country going in the other direction. And that's the big problem. And I think that before um, G20 summits and so on, that the African Union needs to put its own house in order. But it's difficult to do because the African Union, like the United Nations, is an interstate body. It's not some super sovereign entity which speaks on, the, on, on, on behalf of the whole of Africa. So it has to sort of give out various carrots and sticks, but he doesn't have the capacity to enforce it. So it's a great idea, but I think that um, the African continent needs to be able to be united and to speak with one voice before the African Union can actually represent it properly at such gatherings. Exactly. Well, maybe maybe the fact that now they're part of the group of 20, that will give them a little more coherent stability within the African Union, hopefully. As you look at across Africa, and there, there are, what, 54, 55 countries that compose Africa. As you look at that, there, there are areas where there are major problems, like we mentioned, between Egypt and Ethiopia. We'll talk about the Sahel region in a moment. But are, do you see best practices? Are there some areas where they're really making great strides as far as bringing in clean energy, uh, revising their agricultural practices, those types of activities? Are those included in your book? Yes. Um, I think that the tone of the book is one of cautious optimism, if I can put it to you that way. Aware of the challenges, but also quite aware that there are several things going on. Um, Morocco, for example, has been playing a key role in terms of solar energy farms, right? In the case of Ethiopia, they've made use of traditional uh, knowledge uh, to, to um, rehabilitate dams and to create catchment areas and so forth. I, I've been, I mean, this is really strange because we are aware of, of all the coups and the conflict and the terrorism occurring in the Sahel. What's been happening there? is that women and youth have been mobilizing about uh, what, uh, like drought-resistant crops, the planting of drought-resistant crops, because desertification is a major issue. The other thing is that they've been engaged in conflict-smart agriculture. By that I mean, we're, we're um, uh, people who traditionally uh, fight each other over dwindling arable land are now uh, working together to actually use the arable land for their respective communities together. And I think that, that gives me hope. Uh, so where communities understanding the inability or the incapacity of the state to actually step in are doing it on their own. And that gives me a, a tremendous amount of hope. It certainly does. And that's what we need because we have to keep moving forward. We can't just resign ourselves to defeat and say, well, yeah. this problem will go away. It's, or it's cyclical. It's not cyclical. It, I mean, climate has been cyclical, but this is a little more severe and more challenging. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We'd invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or community access television station or an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you have a podcast, or you just have a computer, you like our shows and you would like to share them, please feel free to do so.
Global Connections Television is provided at no cost as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today, we are talking about security on the African continent. And my guest is an expert on this topic. Dr. Hussein Solomon recently co-authored a book titled African Security in the Anthropocene. The, your book is very timely, Dr. Solomon. It's very important. And it's one that we, we all need to read and, and to take to heart and to get serious about this. We were talking about some of the other areas in on the African continent where there have been some success stories, stories where there have been conflicts and that type of thing. What about the Sahel region? I've, how is that faring with, is that interesting desertification or what is the situation there? Well, unfortunately, desertification on a massive scale, they've had uh, wind and pest outbreaks um, because of um, issues of the environment heating up. Uh, you've also had various other diseases affecting cattle uh, and crops and so forth. Um, and unfortunately, food insecurity is a problem, and that in itself is causing tensions between uh, local communities regarding arable land. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the various Islamist militant groups operating in the Sahel is exploiting those kinds of tensions, one, to discredit the government, and two, to insert themselves into communal conflict. And that's easier done in highly fragmented societies where people belong to a particular ethnic group and they also happen to belong to a particular religious group and occupying a different socioeconomic class. And when those uh, uh, divisions are reinforced, unfortunately, you have a recipe for you know, conflict. And so there's, a, so, so there's very much a direct linkage between climate change and the terrorism that you've seen across the Sahel region. You, you mentioned about some of the people who were affected by climate change. Uh, study after study has shown how important women are in dealing with the climate change problem and many other problems in a society. And that in many societies, women do not have equal status as do men. How, how is climate change affecting, adversely affecting women in some parts of Africa and some of the countries. Have, have you, is that included in your book? Absolutely. Um, approximately 52% of the uh, 1.6 billion Africans you had earlier referred to uh, um, uh, are women involved in, in, in agriculture, right? So 52% so of the agricultural labor force is actually women. And because they have a disproportionate uh, um, responsibility in terms of caring for the elderly, caring for the young, caring for the sick, and, and so on. It undermines community resilience if they are unable to provide, if they are unable to farm. One of the big challenges is that if you look at places like Sudan or Mali or Somalia, uh, all of which there is conflict, men tend to migrate to the cities or elsewhere further field to find food, to find uh, employment, leaving essentially female-headed households back in the rural areas. And they are prone to violence, uh, to gender-based violence uh, and, and other forms of exploitation. And so there is a, uh, an important need for gender-specific interventions to occur to ensure that this problem is addressed. And of course there are, well, we were talking about a moment ago, the United Nations and the UN has been in the forefront in promoting conferences and meetings on dealing with this climate change problem. If we look back, well, really back to 1972, the UN was instrumental in launching the first conference or one of the first conferences, I should say. And of course, along the way, Secretaries General Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, uh, Secretary General Guterres have all emphasized how critical this problem. How is the United Nations, I know there are many UN agencies, you mentioned the UN Development Program, you have UN women working with women, you've got the UN Population Fund, but how many, are there various UN agencies 
operating in Africa now helping to try to overcome this problem? Yes, I believe so. Um, they are trying in in various forms. Um, also, I, I, uh, with in the case of UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Fund, in the case of the UNHCR in terms of refugees and issues of internal displacement. Um, so all of these agencies are operating, but one of the problems is the fact that they're not adequately funded. Member states uh, pledge certain things, but they don't necessarily deliver. The other problem, uh, and, and, and not to detract from the situation in Ukraine, but I think that the situation in Ukraine has essentially sucked up the oxygen around funding and 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 attention, and so Africa has kind of fallen off, and uh, to the detriment, of course, to the Africans itself, and and so the situation is increasingly desperate. And then, of course, again talking about Ukraine, you have an interesting situation where, by because of climate change, there are issues of food insecurity on the African continent, and at the same time, you know. That that uh, grain and wheat deal through the Black Sea that Turkey was brokering uh, has fell through. So now we now, especially countries like Egypt, which uh, are heavily reliant upon a grain coming in from Russia, doesn't have access to it, uh, and so forth. So so the more you think about it the world is one and our challenges our our sources of insecurity is actually interconnected it certainly is and our interdependence has been proven time and time again especially with the as you mentioned the 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 closing of the black sea to the exports agricultural exports and how they impact people in all really in all parts of the world but certainly in africa Europe, North America, but it it just shows how interrelated we are. And again, as you mentioned about the funding too, that's a very important thing. And of course, the United Nations is not a one world government. It can't tax people. It has to depend upon the member states, the 193 member states to contribute to these programs. And that is absolutely critical. And not only do member states need to contribute, they also need to be supportive and to take the lead in helping to carry out the programs so that they can be successful. Well, in the last minute or so that we have, are there any other items in your book? I know your book, we can't do justice to it in 25 minutes, but do you have other another recommendation or two from the book to leave with our viewers? Look, I think if there's one takeaway from the book is that in a globalizing world, insecurity anywhere, threatens security everywhere. Uh, and as and as the Bible speaks about it, you know, we have to be our brother's keeper um, because I think we have reached um, a, um, the a precipice where we either sink or swim together. And that's the one thing that I would say is my is will be my takeaway from from the book. And that is extremely important. And you're absolutely correct. And we are in this battle and not only with climate change, but with dealing with terrorism, dealing with uh, clean water, dealing with uh, security, cybersecurity, whatever it is. And we can't just say, well, we'll let somebody else do it. It's not my problem. Let's put our money into this. We have to work on this together. And when we look at what we're dealing with as far as actually investing in so many of these international activities, it's a very small part of the budget. It's almost uh, in the United States in particular, maybe other countries are paying more like the Scandinavian countries, but it's a very minuscule part of the entire budget of the United States. But what happens in Ukraine is extremely important and it will affect, it's already affecting people in your area of the world, my area of the world, and it will get worse. But uh, Dr. Hussein Solomon, you have a very interesting book, very fascinating book. We encourage everyone to take a look at it. But I want to thank you so much for a very interesting and a very informative program. Thank you very much for having me. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.